Deacon this morning, and we just wanted to um, think about how God has called us all to service. Maybe not so much so, not everyone is a, uh, a master servant, if you will, called into the office of a deacon, but we are all, as children of God, called to serve. Would you pray with me? Father, as we are humbled at the privilege and the task to look into your word and to rightly divide it, to cut it straight, in a day and age in which so many are treating the Bible as putty in their hands, there's only one meaning we want to concern ourselves with, and that is your meaning, regardless of what we think and what we think the meaning to be. It would make us diligent students of your word to read it, to understand it, and to put it into practice. For the praise of your glory, we ask it. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in Acts chapter 6. We'd like to look at a sermon that I've entitled, Every Man a Minister, to see how the early church organized for ministry. We'll look at the first seven verses of Acts chapter 7, and just to orient our, our thinking a little bit, though God sovereignly and specifically calls certain qualified men to be under shepherds in the full-time vocational ministry of the Word, such as myself, where God just throws in a paycheck to study the Word and shepherd God's people in the truth. Spurgeon says any Christian has a right to disseminate the gospel who has the ability to do so. And more, not only has the right, but it is his duty so to do as long as he lives. For the propagation of the gospel is life, not to a few, but to all the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the measure of grace entrusted to him by the Holy Spirit, each man is bound to minister in his day and generation, both to the church and among unbelievers. J.C. Ryle that great Anglican preacher had said that the world's idea of greatness is to rule. But Christian greatness consists in serving. There were plenty of disciples willing to argue and fight for the throne. Lord, who's going to be on your right and who on your left in your coming kingdom? And Jesus is the one that robed himself with a towel and stooped to wash stinky feet. Years ago, Bud Wilkinson of U Oklahoma University, before joining the president's physical fitness program, was asked, what contribution does professional sports make to the physical fitness of Americans? And his answer was very little. Very little. You got 50,000 spectators versus 22 men. You've got 50,000 people desperately in need of exercise being entertained by the, uh, a couple of dozen desperately in need of rest. That's an ample illustration for what often has gone on in ministry. The typical church, host of spectators, handful of participants. Let's flock to our churches to watch the professionals perform. And boy, if they perform good enough, we'll, maybe we'll come back next week and... Uh, uh, be entertained by it again. There's a failure of understanding the doctrine of the church and in particularly what God has called pastors to do, not to stand up and be entertainers and to be clever, redefining how to do effective ministry. You know, if you really want to be honest, faithful ministers are like dinosaurs. We're just tapping into how faithful ministry has always been done. Pastor's just an equipper, according to Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. He's one saved sinner training other saved sinners. That's the church. It's a ministry of multiplication. If you were to boil down the shepherd's job description, preacher, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And dear friends, our point in the message today is the latter. See if we can't Put a heavenly burr under your saddle this morning. Think with me through the 
the chronological formation, the development of a vibrant, living, growing church that we are confronted with in the book of Acts. Now, even before you get to the book of Acts, in the first gospel account, Matthew 16, Jesus introduced the concept of the church. And he says, you know, after Peter, the impulsive one, you know, the one with the hoof-shaped mouth, that you know, open mouth, insert foot, that one. And uh, incredibly, God revealed the identity of his son. And Peter said, thou art the Christ. And Jesus says, upon that rock, not you, Peter Rock, but that confession, I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus is still building his church. Amen? You know, when you talk about Grace Bible Church, this is not my church, it's not your church, this is Christ's church. So he says he promises to build it, come hell or high water, no matter what obstacles we face, what kind of unfaithfulness in many church experiences, Jesus reigns and rules, he's going to build his church. And so in Luke's gospel, Luke 24, there is a great commission given. In Luke 24, 44, he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me, Jesus says, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You might recall that in Luke 24, Jesus is walking and along with some of his disciples that he prevented their, them from understanding who they're walking with. And so he had already been crucified, already risen. And he said, what are you guys talking about? They're like, are you the only one in Jerusalem? They answer him that doesn't know that Christ was crucified. And he takes them to the scriptures that this has always been the plan of the father to crush the son to save sinners. This is not a good plan gone awry. So you've got the concept of the church, Matthew 16. You get into Luke 24, the great commission. And then his ascension, beginning of verse 49. He says, you are witnesses of these things. How do you get to be an apostle? Sign me up, you know, take me, right? No, you needed to have been witness to the Christ. You're witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. So you've got crucifixion, you've got resurrection. A few days later, ascension. God's work's not done on planet Earth. You, after going to, reading through all the way here in, in Luke 24, Dr. Luke doesn't stop penning Revelation. Acts is basically Luke, chapter, Luke part two. So when you do get to, to Acts in chapter one and verse 15, we are told that there are already 120 believers. Acts 1.15 At that time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together. You know, they're back in Jerusalem at the temple, and God's already been calling people to himself, 120 believers. When you get to chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. This is the birthday of the church. The church is born. You're not going to find the church in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit places believers into Christ. This is the sign of the new covenant. And the church is officially born. From there, you've got amazing growth. In chapter 2, verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So what did we start with? We started with 120 believers, and automatically we've got 3,000 more 
who had received God's word, they've been baptized, and they're added to the church. Belief, baptism, church membership. That's the way it is all through the book of Acts. The Lord adding to the number day by day, verse 42. And over the next three chapters, chapters 3, 4, and 5, the apostles are busy preaching, they're healing, and they're persecuted. In fact, opposition fueled the flame of growth. Surely, as Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs would become the seed of the church, as it always has. You follow Jesus, they crucified our master, they've stoned the apostles and prophets, which are sent to them, preaching the good news. Oh, you want to you be in ministry? You want to help people be able to have their sins forgiven in eternity with God? People are going to love you after that news, right? No. The more you resemble Jesus, the heart of that persecution is going to come. You followers of the way. Well, when you get to chapter 5, you've got the serious sins of the saints. God struck down Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad that uh, if you were to do the same thing, like you're uh, going to give this certain amount of money and you t tell somebody that you gave this amount, and you know the first sins of the saints was pretty severe. In verse 11, great fear came over the whole church. Don't go to that church, you might die. In verse 13, none of the rest dared to associate with them. Chapter 5, verse 14, all the more believers, multitudes of men and women constantly added to their number. The gospel goes forth and the church is built. Verse 18, the apostles are jailed. Verse 27, they're commanded not to teach in that name. And yet, verse 42, every day they're in the temple. House to house. They kept teaching. They kept preaching. You cannot silence the true church. Let me give you a little disclaimer here as we're uh, setting our trajectory. In your study of the, the book of Acts, just because the New Testament church did, doesn't mean it's for us. When's the last time you got bitten by a rattlesnake and didn't go try to get uh, uh, the anti-venom, you know, like Paul did? Paul didn't need it. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. We can't transfer all directly in our application. We need to sift through the grid of a historical grammatical context because Acts is a transitional book. It's not until you get to the later epistles that there's not a whole lot of extra study. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. It's pretty clear. But Acts is a transitional book between the Old Covenant and the New. Not prescriptive, but descriptive. Not all of Scripture is written to us, but it is written for us. We can't claim promises given to certain other people unless they're timeless truths that are applicable to the church. So let's take church leadership and ministry principles that are repeated from Acts in the epistles. Luke introduces us to a new phase in the development of the church. 120 people, 3,000 people added, church is growing, church growth done God's way, not man's way, and Houston, we have a problem. There's a little contention that starts going on. And Luke is going to use our text today to exhort every believer with the need to enlist as servers in order to increase the effectiveness of the church. What do we do when God brings us hopeless people that are outside of Christ and need the good news of Jesus, when God brings us the destitute, when God brings us even believers who are searching for a healthy place to grow and to serve. Well, he's going to show how the church is to organize in order to make the church more effective in her worship, more effective in her service, more effective in her witness to the world. And as we go to Acts 6, our text for today, and read it. I know that some have said that here in Acts 6, those that are chosen, the seven chosen, that were the first deacons. And I'm not convinced they're the first deacons because the qualifications of these men are very different than 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so as the progress of Revelation, Scripture's being penned, 
by the time you get to the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, which are given for what the church is and how it functions. So you've got the full-fledged office of elders and deacons, First Timothy 3 and Titus 1 for elders as well. But it's full-orbed. You've got the seedbed for what would become the ministry of deacons here, though it may not have been the first deacons. Acts chapter 6. Notice our account beginning in verse 1. Now at this time, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, of wisdom, whom we may appoint in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid their hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And lest you read verse 7 as just an added, unneeded note, if what happened in verse 1 were not handled rightly and biblically as the church was growing, and just any, anyone with a pulse will do in leadership, you have the contemporary church. Or if you have the apostles who give up the preaching of word and the ministry of prayer for serving of tables, you don't study the word of God. You've got nothing to say. Stay away from the sacred desk. And yet, God's work done God's way will not lack in God's blessing. So the first point we see in verse 1 is the need expressed. It's been suggested, that, like I said, that this is one of the most important and discussed verses in the book and complicated. Who's really being spoken about? It's important to ascertain in order to understand the events in Jerusalem in the Jerusalem church. These are Hellenistic Jews, Greek-speaking Hellenists. Lots of ink spilled, lots of trees killed, Many commentators from Chrysostom, the early church father, onward identified them by their language and geographic origin. Back in chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, Luke tells us that devout Jews had come. They'd settled in Jerusalem. The Jews of the diaspora settled native-born Aramaic-speaking Jews. Their native tongue, Greek, not Aramaic or Hebrew. So they'd responded to the good news of the gospel and they'd become part of the church. And yet each of two groups had had their own synagogues, their own copies of the scripture, and there, here they are together. First group, Greek-speaking Jews, had the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament from the Hebrew. And then the Hebraic Jews who read from the original Hebrew Scriptures. We've got formula for contention here. You can see how linguistic and cultural differences could bring about division much in the same way people coming into the church today bring their own differences and their own baggage. And if we don't do as Paul says in Ephesians 4 to protect the unity that the Spirit has already established, there's going to be much trouble. People can respond less than favorably without grace, without forbearance, without forgiveness because you don't look like, look like them, you don't smell like them, you don't talk like them. We're all different. And God is carving out through the mass of humanity very different people coming together and collecting in the church house. You know, James even addresses favoritism and elitism being partial in the book of James. 
The Talmud points out Phariseeism held contempt for the Hellenists as second-class Israelites since they are not native-born. Now, you all know I'm a foreigner. I've only been here almost six years. I'm from Maine. Back in Maine, my uh, uh, one of my pastors growing up came from Pennsylvania, and my grandfather, though he loved his pastor, did not accept him as a native-born Ameri- uh, uh, native native-born Ameri- native Mainer. And he was tutoring him how to how to grow veggies in the garden. He always liked to chatter to my pastor how that you're you're a flatlander from away, you know. And almost in, in Maine, you almost got to have your first three generations of the family tree there in order to be accepted. And so the coldness is not just the weather in Maine. I'll I'll leave the rest. Um, so here you've got all these people collecting together. May have been a degree of resentment or prejudice. And there are those who are overlooked, not necessarily intended uh, that they be overlooked. Since there's, we don't find any attempt in showing and assigning of blame. But here's what solicited the need, a very real need. You got growth, number one. Growth that's explo- uh, explosive. How large when you get to Acts chapter 6? Well, 5,000 men at last count. That's chapter 4, verse 4. So you add in the women and children, you could have upwards of 20 plus thousand people. And without the means of mass communication, leadership and administration problems associated with such large congregations were enormous. There's lots of things that smaller churches like ours can get away with and not facilitate quite so much. This is before email, no church mailings, no newsletter, no texting group list or anything. Rapid growth left little time for the church to adjust. Growth pains create administrative problems that affect unity because there's those that don't like change. Change is hard, though it's wonderful as God is adding to our midst. So growth is explosive. And a second factor is this body life, the daily life of the church. Now back in chapter uh, chapter 2 and verse 45, As they're coming to church, they're selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. They are so elated that God would set his love upon them. He'd forgive them their sins. It's like, it's just money. It's just belongings. Uh, you, you got a need? Let me, let me help you out. This is healthy body life. If you were to go to the 40 one another commands of the New Testament, you see what healthy body life looks like as we're preferring one another and loving one another and one another and one another to the glory of God. You know, later on in chapter 4 and verse 35, these possessions that they were selling, they're, they're laying them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributing, distributed to each as any had need. So it wasn't this mine, mine, mine. You know, this is God's stuff. God's time, talents that God's given me, the resources God has given me. You know, so that when my car breaks down, it's like, God, your, your car is broken down. You know, I'm not going to get a hissy fit over it. Daily life in the church, selling possessions, apostles distributing according to need. Combined resources of sacrifice, intimacy, you know, uh, started to be lacking. When you've got a big church, a bigger church is it's harder to engage in deep relationships. You know, it's kind of like, you miss a Sunday here, we kind of all know, because your, your row's not filled up kind of thing. But in that body life, there's an issue among the distribution of needs. Real aid and support, alms and charitable giving. James says that this is just part of true undefiled religion in James 1.27. Take care of the needy. Biblical benevolence has a place. In the local church. It starts in the church house and works out from there. Timothy is taught by Paul that this is, it's part of ministry to honor true widows. We don't just take in every widow, but those that are not chattering about and being gossip mongers and slanderers, those that are, are honoring Jesus, there's a qualification to be taken into the roster of the church. 
You know, Israel had to be reminded from time to time of its obligation to care for the less fortunate. In Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29, the tithe on year three and year six of a seven-year sabbatical cycle. You've got the Levite, the alien, the orphan and widow shall come and be satisfied. You know, those that are trying to use the Mosaic law to teach how we give in the local church, and they're going back to the tithe, you know, they were, uh, you're tithing 33 and a third of your income. There's several tithes. And so this was one of them. Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. So here in Acts 6, we are. Uh, there's no sign that th this neglect was intentional. It's just simple overflight, o oversight. There, there's scores of people coming to faith in Christ. The apostles are clearly too busy with all the people, all the needs that grew. It's kind of a scene reminiscent of Moses. Remember when Moses alone is, is leading Israel, judging the Israelites, and Jethro counsels him, his father-in-law, has some great wisdom from God. Delegate. Delegation. So there's a lack of distribution that led to dissension here in our text. There's a complaint, verse 1. Murmuring. Displeasure. And we are quite prone to that. You know, when we go back to Numbers 11 and our thinking and you know, you're, the children of Israel are wandering around the backside of a desert and God is miraculously, graciously raining down food upon them day after day after day. And they're overflowing with gratitude, right? No. They're murmuring. They're complaining. Just like what started to happen here in the first century church. You know, Numbers 10, they went from the wilderness of Sinai to Paran as they started out for the first time with the promise that God's going to guide them each step of the way. And then once you do get to Numbers 11, they complained on the journey. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned or announced like I, just, I came back yesterday with one of the kids from a little getaway and we're going back late afternoon or something. And I remember what vacation was like in the car, on the ride to wherever we're going. And my brother and I would bicker in the back seat, murmuring like, are we there yet? How many of you parents, many times, are we there yet? And that's exactly what the children of Israel are doing. And as the disciples of Jesus are multiplying, people get belie they believe, they got baptized, they're joining the church, thousands of people. They're no different than that mixed multitude that yielded to their intense craving back in the wilderness, who's going to give us meat to eat? Remember the fish in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic? There's nothing here but this, but this stinking manna. And you know, as we uh, were packing up for our camping expedition, we're getting ready for the one that we do the end of the month. You know, you can... You kind of like the elegant stuff at home and the extra seasonings and whatnot. Anything will do when you're cooking over an open fire on a camping. They didn't like it. Moses responds to the murmurers, Lord, why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you've laid the burden of this people on me? And beloved, if you're not extremely careful in learning from them in the Old Testament, others in the New Testament, how to do everything without grumbling and disputing, Philippians 2.14. It can happen to us. God's got no tolerance for complaining and gratitude. But these are become symptomatic, not just of a growing church, but an ingrown church, the griping and the complaining. Well, in the midst of Christianity multiplying, the task got too big. Good problem to have. So the, it needs a little organizing to be efficient and effective. There's a reason that God would soon flesh out two offices in the New Testament. 
of elders and deacons to lead his people. And there's a reason why he gifts all of his followers. So the leader must learn to diagnose problems, diagnose the needs. That's why we're examining it this morning. Because Satan could have taken that murmuring and used any number of things, even here at Grace Bible Church, unless we are sober in spirit and vigilant and petitioning our God to sustain us, to protect us, to grow us in resemblance to Christ, to be diligent, to preserve the unity commended in Scripture. You know, Satan tried persecution. That didn't work. He tried corruption. Now he's trying dissension. Maybe dissension will work to bust this fledgling church wide open that has members into the thousands now in Acts 6. Here's where we see the administrative decision made. So exercise the power of observation here. You, as you move into verses 2 through 4, there's a problem examined. And where the outline is on the back of your bulletin, you notice there's several subpoints here. This is the main part that we're wanting to absorb from the text. So as this problem is examined, there's a lot in our day that would say, we need to get back to the early church. They were power conscious, and we today are problem conscious. Well, that's only a half truth, I think. They had power, but they also had problems. Don't be ignorant of the problems that they had. Transitions and growth are not easily navigated. Things that are new, things that are different, people that the Lord brings in, like the Hellenists, where church is changing. So you start off with this quandary. You know, they said it's not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. That's not the right answer. Your preaching is the most probable meaning here of what's going on, the neglect of the Word of God. God gets His truth out there through faithful Bible exposition. It's not approved by God and should not be approved by man to let preaching slip for serving. Serving's important. It's a priority. Lots of good things that will take you away from the main thing. Lots of important things from the most important. I love one of my mentors who has used this philosophy of plan and neglect. You neglect everything until your, your work in the Word is done because Sunday's coming without let up every single week. Wednesday's coming. So you can't let the preaching and teaching of the Word of God slip for another thing of priority. My first church experience or pastoral experience after Bible college, I was serving under a pastor who most of the time when the snows came, he's out shoveling the snow instead of keeping his butt in the sheet studying the Word. And it's not that anybody's going to come along because many times in a small church, you're the chief cook and bottle washer. Plunging toilets, right? Uh, cleaning the pews. But the apostles are saying here, we cannot give up the study of the Word and serve tables. That would be the undoing of the church. So we've got an option. Let's enlist servants. Luke refrains from using the term deacon, which is crucial. These, as I mentioned, are probably not the first deacons. Yet there is a clear functioning of serving. You know, its cognate diakonia appears twice. In verse 1, it is translated distribution. In verse 4, it's translated ministry. There's so much more that there's, there's papers, there's articles talking about deacon ministry in the church that you could take home with you. Though all Christians, disciples, are called and commanded and equipped to serve, only some are in the official office organizing the serving ministry coming alongside the elders, making sure that ministry happens. That's developed in 1 Timothy 3. Not just anyone will do, as in many churches. Not just a warm body. Not just a willingness. Some I've heard this said throughout the, the last 30 years of ministry. Well, he's not quite good enough for an elder. We'll make him a deacon. You've got a flawed theology, sir. 
implying that it's a lesser area. Obviously, they're not reading all of 1 Timothy 3. There's a different role, a different function, but it's not not important. You've got two main leadership structures, those that are biblically qualified shepherd elders and the biblically qualified deacons that are helping the, take things off the plate of the elders so that they could have the ministry of the word and prayer. But we must have spiritual men. Men able to make an application of spiritual truth. God uses clean vessels, qualified vessels, and called vessels. Since God is the one that raises up leaders, there's a lot of people that raise themselves up thinking that whether they be an elder or a deacon, that it's a place of prestige and authority. I don't care what office you're talking about. There's no authority. The best that a the pastors have is, is a delegated authority. If you're faithful to teach the Word of God, God comes with His own authority through His Word. Nobody in leadership, pastor or elder, or pastor or deacon, has authority. Many times you, you wish that you could pass it off onto somebody else. So all in the body, all that have believed and been baptized and joined the church are called to ministry. All are called to holiness. All are called to serving and aspiring ought to be something that as, as you grow in Christ-likeness, what if God would call you into eldership or deaconry? So though given to these who would serve poor on behalf of Christ, all would do well to listen and learn from Christ. Notice the five requirements, five qualifications. In uh, verse number three, these are to be men. And let every woman's liber who wants to be preaching and everything else, that's where this would fit in, right? Uh, God has, uh, is not a chauvinist. The Apostle Paul is not a chauvinist. Women have extremely vital roles. If you take out believing women from the church, every church would fold. And yet there is clear godly male leadership in the church and in the home. As women do have vital roles, you see Dorcas, you see Lydia, the seller of purple, you see Phoebe, Priscilla, Philip's daughters. The church is full of women servant leaders in the church. Keep, keeping the baptistry clean, getting the communion table ready, getting the gals together to study Scripture, the older instructing the younger how to be keepers of the home. And yet God's design is for men to assume leadership in the home and in the church. Entire submission. Not teaching men, not exercising authority. Many women are exercising authority. Many men being sissies and slackers. And that would be for a sermon for another time. So where did they come from? So you've got to have some men in leadership. They are among you. Believers. We're talking about disciples, followers, learners, the brethren, all who have believed. Chapter 2, verse 44. This is a congregation, a multitude of those who have believed. God has placed in the fellowship gifted men. You don't look outside yourselves. Look from among you. Among the brethren. When you come to faith in Christ, dear brother, dear sister, the moment you're in fellowship with God the Father through forgiveness of sin, the Holy Spirit imparts a gifting to you. Whether you go to 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12, Ephesians 4 or 1 Peter 4, we've got lists. Not of the sign gifts that would authenticate the messengers who wrote Scripture, but serving gifts. Romans 12, 6. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And dear friend, if you're not exercising your gift in the body, it, you're being disobedient. And I say that out of love for you because I want God to be able to bless the socks off you and He does not bless disobedience. Maybe you'd 
get on our websites and our YouTubes and go through the two-week series on how to discern and employ your gifting to the body and minister it in faithful obedience. Years ago, a faithful church's attendance was beginning to approach a thousand. Happens to be a favorite church of mine, Grace Community Church. It was in the early 70s. An evangelical magazine sent a writer to do an article on the phenomenal growth that Grace Community Church was experiencing. Grace Community Church has been pastored for 50 years through noted expositor John MacArthur. John says that after a long time visiting our services and gathering info, this journalist for the evangelical magazine wrote an article titled it, The Church with 900 Ministers. Let that just percolate for a moment. The Church of 900 Ministers. His point was that almost no one at Grace Church viewed ministry as the exclusive domain of paid clergy. Lay people understood that doing the work of ministry was their own duty. The pastor's task is to equip them. Unfortunately, many Christians view lay ministry as a radical concept. You know, we're, supposed, we're not supposed to do ministry. That's what we pay our pastor for, some of them think. Even our language reflects this dichotomy. We speak of ministers and laymen as if they were functional opposites. But that's not biblical thinking. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says Christ gave the church apostles. That's the foundation for the church. Prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers for the very purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. God gave gifts to his beloved ones and he gave gifted ones to help develop that in the ministry. Why is it that some churches are they're doctrinally sound? They're faithful to God's Word and what they teach, and yet they seem stunted in their growth and lacking any sense of vibrancy or power. In many cases, it's precisely because they neglect this basic truth. The pews filled with people who expect to be ministered to rather than to minister. It's a verb. Too many church members believe they're supposed to be spectators while paid staff do the work. Nothing will shake a church out of lethargy faster than the realization that it's the saints to whom Scripture assigns the task of ministry. You know, the pastors that have worked themselves out of a job as if that were going to happen, right? You know, the unique calling of pastors and teaching is primary to equip the members of the body for that express purpose. So when, you know, I remember uh, talking to a loved one, you know, uh, were you blessed at that service that you visited? And, uh, or, or, or she said that I wasn't blessed at that service I visited. And I said, well, uh, did you ever think about being a blessing? The flip of the coin? Not what you get out of the service, but what did you give in service to your king? After all, the need seems an assignment given. Those who are saved are gifted, and pastors are just helping to develop it. So we need godly men that are believers. Thirdly, those of good reputation, Dr. Luke says. Not just saved, but they're growing. There's a vibrant testimony. They're well spoken of. They're approved. To say that is to say this, that if you're in a position of visibility and leadership, you must be worthy of the visibility. Why did we put in the bulletin that we're affirming a brother as a new deacon in our church? Because If you know of things where there is not those qualifications that Scripture mandates, there is no way for a person to serve in the capacity, whether they be an elder or a deacon. You know, there were approving of widows, those who were well attested in good deeds, 1 Timothy 5.10. Later on in our same book here, in Acts 10, you got Cornelius. In Acts 16, you got Timothy and Acts 22, you got Ananias who came to Paul. Without exception, all of those men were well spoken of. What about you, dear brother? What's said of you? 1 Timothy 3, 7. Elders need to be those even approved on the outside. 
You know, if you're a businessman, you're a shyster, you've got no position of shepherding God's flock in an official capacity. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 show that it is not a matter of power and lording it over, Peter says, those allotted to your charge. You just, just set an example of godliness for the people to follow. In Hebrews 13, 7, the congregation has said, consider the outcome of your leader's faith and so follow. Paul often would say, follow me as I'm following Christ. Timothy, he says, be an example of the believers. Especially since uh, you know, they'd be responsible with large sums of, sums of money. They need to be men of integrity. Because like people, like priests, what leaders end up doing in moderation, the people will do in excess. Be an exemplary example to God's people. You must be a person of good reputation. Well, he throws in a, a, a fourth. These, these men that you're considering, they need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Your Simeon, we're told, was just and devout and the Holy Spirit was upon him. How about Barney? Barnabas was a man who's full of the Spirit. Remember the flow of thought? Holy Spirit promised in John 14, 17, Jesus said, I'm going away and I'm going to send you another the same kind. They're going to be marked by the indwelling of the Spirit, those who are placed in Christ. And that's what happened back in chapter 2 of the book of Acts when the Spirit came upon God's people. Paul commands this ongoing be being filled by the Spirit. If a man or a woman of God is growing in grace, they're, they're taking heed to their walk that they are following the steps of the Spirit who inscripturated God's revelation. It's got to be true, especially with leaders. Not just in the home, how about in the church? You own a, uh, a book entitled The Fulfilled Family. It talks about this principle being full of the Holy Spirit. It's key to marriage, it's key to parenting, and it's the key to ministry. Dr. J. Adams had given this note on love. He said, the love in view must be produced by the Holy Spirit. No man unaided by his presence can attain to it. In essence, it is a desire, it is a desire to obey God in order to please him and to do whatever he says is best for others. It's not a feeling first and depends upon nothing in the one he, to be loved, but is generated in the lover and moves out toward the loved one, even when he or she is unloving, unlovely, or unlovable. Love conquers all. Such love is the sort God had for sinful man. It always involves giving of oneself to others, but nothing is expected in return. So if you're a husband and you're told twice in Ephesians 5 to love your wife, how are you going to love her who you have no capacity to love without the leading of the Spirit through the Word? Men need to lead in the church. Men need to lead in the home. We need to be men full of the Holy Spirit, fully yielded to His control in every area of life. You want to know what Grace Bible Church needs? Men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. Walking in step with the Word. We need people who are Word-filled, who are, have Spirit-filled lives, who are obsessed with obeying God's Word. God says, jump, we say, how high, Lord? In the same book we're studying, Acts 5.32, we are witnesses. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. You see, people need to see transformation. The work, the results of the Spirit worked out in the lives of the redeemed. And by the way, a fifth one here. He says, those that are going to be chosen to serve this real need in this growing assembly in Jerusalem, men of wisdom. Full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. Must have a biblical theological knowledge. Know how to apply to the situations of life. And that's what, what really thrills my soul as a pastor is when people are wanting more training. As, you know, like, 
Sunday morning's not enough. Wednesday night's not enough. Whether we're doing hermeneutics class or or biblical counseling class, it's like, you got any more for me? If you're taking part of whatever we're offering, I'll, I'll burn burn it at both ends if need be. That's what thrills my soul. You know, some go off to seminary. Some would like to. Some head to college. Others being trained in-house. Praise Jesus. Where does leadership training take place? Healthy local church. God raises the cream to the top. As we assault heaven in our prayers every Wednesday, God, raise up more elders. Raise up more deacons. Raise up godly musicians who are more intent about God's kingdom than their own kingdom and whose worship expresses their unhypocritical heart rather than just their skill. Yeah, we need the skill. We don't want people hitting all the wrong notes and singing off key, but some of the sweetest words are those offered in humility of, you know, Pastor, teach me God's word. Show me how to study it for my own soul sanctification. Where can I be used in this small church house to advance God's kingdom? We need males, we need believers, those of good reputation, filled with the Spirit, biblical wisdom. In other words, people are growing. Can't dry water from a dry well. So as the problem is, was examined and this quandary was elicited, their option number one was enlist servants. We need more people serving to this vast group of believers God's collecting to himself in the church. And he explains the supremacy of study. You know, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Busy ourselves, devoted to the apostles pledged to devote themselves to ministry. And ministry demands total commitment. No substitute for hard work and discipline. A young man once asked the gifted expositor, Donald Gray Barnhouse, I would give the world to be able to teach the Bible like you, Dr. Barnhouse. And looking him straight in the eye, Dr. Barnhouse said, good, because that's exactly what it will take. Sold out to Jesus. The apostles devoted themselves. There is no, nothing more of a priority than studying the Word of God and petitioning God to do that which we cannot. Prayer and the Word. You know, it's mentioned first as even the ministry of the Word hinges on prayer. Utter dependence. Waiting on God for His message. It's where the hard work of ministry happens, where God, I don't have a clue what this text is saying. You know, devotion to prayer characterized the entire assembly back in chapter 1, verse 14. How much more it needs to be the example from leadership. You're actually not prepared to preach if you're not having a lifestyle, an attitude of prayer. Never allowing the administrative stuff to crowd out personal worship. You ever think about this, that the, the pastor's job is not just preaching, but his job is prayer. It's important for the church to realize that most, the most appropriate way for the pastor to show love is by devoting his time to prayer and the Word. Even if he's not responding to the text messages or the emails quite as often as he ought to. He's not just a minister of the local church, though they sign the paycheck. He's a minister of Christ's gospel, a servant of the word. You know, a lot of churches, when you uh, look, what, what are you looking for in a pastor? They, they want one who's an organizer, a promoter, a sort of vice president or manager or coach. The apostles knew that their priority was praying, preaching, teaching, and studying the Word. And if they gave up that time to serve in the tables, the church would bust wide open. 
And they let nothing, however pressing, distract them. Chambers put it this way. He said, prayer doesn't fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. If one thing ought to characterize Grace Bible Church, not only do they take the Bible serious there, they take the command to pray serious over there. You know, the word, I mean, ministry demands total commitment, everything a man has. So there's the need expressed, the problem examined, and the solution expressed, verses 5 to 7. Here's how we see the results of them organizing for maximum effectiveness. They were laying hands on those qualified men that God was raising up. It's a sign of approval, a sign of support, affirmation. Some churches would have thrown complainers out, option number one. But the first apostolic church of Jerusalem on one corner of the city, right down the street, second apostolic church of Jerusalem. That works. Not in God's economy. Option two might be to shun different people. I've seen this. James Montgomery Boyce mentioned in his commentary that one of the things Presbyterians do is outvote the dissenters, cautiously following Robert's rule of order. Well, that's good democracy, but that's bad body life. Option number three. How about separation? Just leave them to themselves. They'll kill each other in the process, right? Here, the church followed the biblical, God-honoring decisions. They responded in faith and obedience. Some think that laying on of hands is some kind of spiritual power connected. I like the way J. Vernon McGee put it, the only thing you can communicate through laying on of hands is germs. But uh, it's still a principle in Scripture that there's that affirmation of godly qualified leadership. Moses commissioned Joshua as his successor. The church at Antioch placed their hands on Barnabas and Paul. And so it continues as a principle or a practice. So after that, what happened? Well, verse 7 wraps it all up. The word of God kept spreading. The meaning is clear. The word of God as the apostles continued to preach it had continually increasing influence and effect. It was responsible for the increasing number. Like I was, I think I've reiterated twice this morning. God's work done God's way brings God's results. Man's work or God's work done man's way is lacking them. Church isn't some social club. To be known for physical service as well as spiritual. And the disciples, they're multiplying so that if you leader take care of the depth, God will take care of the breadth. That last count, we had 5,000 men. That's church growth God, done God's way. They didn't sell out for the pragmatic church growth strategy or watering down the message or ignoring biblical qualifications where some have told those that do biblical ministry, you, you, you practice such things as church discipline, you'll empty that place. No, well, that's what God's called us to. Faithful biblical ministry. So the disciples multiplied and the priests, what is that? Finally, the religious leaders with hard hearts were crumbling under the power of the gospel and its application in lives, which could not be denied. According to historian Josephus, he relates that in that day there were four priestly tribes, each numbering 5,000. On any given day, you got 5,000 priests in Jerusalem. Many, though not all priests, were Sadducees. And they've already been noted as taking the lead in the opposition, the book of Acts. And perhaps this is why opposition soon arose against Stephen. Disciples multiplying. God was getting the religious leaders' attention too. So in conclusion, I propose to you that as a church, we follow this model. Organize 
to make the church more effective in worship, more effective in service, and her witness to the world as we exalt, as we equip, and as we evangelize together. The pattern in the text is for life today. They were ready to adjust their procedures, alter their organizational structure, divide various responsibilities, and assign different functions, all varying aspects of one total ministry done for the glory of God. So many people that want to get back to the first century church, thinking that they'd be more biblical. And yet Luke presents the most biblical approach is to adapt our traditional methods and structures to meet existing situations for the sake of the gospel and the fame of Jesus. You know, we don't seek to reinvent ministry through clever strategies, but tie into how faithful ministry has always been done. Biblical ministry, relying on divine revelation. This is what the glorious gospel of grace produces and compels us. Would you pray with me? Father, my thoughts are brought to the Apostle Paul who wrote to Timothy who didn't see himself as anything special. He used to be a persecutor of the church. And yet you mercied him by putting him in the ministry. I pray for your church here at Grace that you would overwhelm your people with a sense of the privilege of not only having our sins forgiven and an eternal home in your presence, but you called us to the privilege of service. So multiply our effectiveness as a local church. We continue to pray that you'd raise up godly elders and, and deacons and musicians and Sunday school teachers. You know, you know the needs better than we do. Use it to advance your eternal cause. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.